take your seats. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to move into the second series of lectures this morning. And each lecture is going to be about 15 minutes. And we kindly ask the speakers, since we're late, to make it, uh, if possible, shorter. We'll start with the first lecture. And Dr. Jamali will present Dr. Matthew Meyerson. Thank you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure, actually, to present uh, Dr. Matthew Meyerson. He is professor of pathology and medical oncology at Harvard Medical School and director of the Cancer Center, uh, uh, director for cancer genome discovery at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He really has been instrumental in his work at the genetics level and has discovered many genomic alterations that have enabled the development of targeted therapies for lung cancer, especially the EGFR mutation. Uh, it's a great honor for us to welcome Dr. Meyerson, who will be speaking to us this morning on genomic drivers of cancer. Well, uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and it's a real honor uh, to uh, uh, be here in this uh, beautiful city, in this beautiful country uh, uh, that I visit for the first time. And also, it's a really uh, just such an honor to um, uh, be here on the occasion first of the uh, 150th anniversary of the founding of the American University of Beirut, and uh, second on the occasion of the uh, uh, inauguration of my uh, dear friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Fadlal Khoury, who is really, as I think uh, all of you have heard, a, a, a great scientist. Uh, a great physician, um, a, um, a visionary and, and uh, inspiring and generous leader, and uh, a kind and good man. And uh, it's just an enormous honor to be here to honor you. So I, I just wanted to include here today's news from, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Sadegh who uh, uh, spoke about this, that the American University of, of, of Beirut uh, will establish a center for genomic medicine, uh, including a patient-focused uh, cancer genome diagnostics. And so I think this is really a, a, a perfect introduction uh, to our uh, to to uh, my my slides here, and a, a kind of perfect introduction to to what we're doing. And 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 cancer, as as I think you're all well aware, is a disease of the genome, and, and alterations include uh, mutations, as shown here, uh, copy number changes, such as amplifications. Uh, or, or, or deletions, uh, chromosomal rearrangements and translocations, uh, and infection. Um, recurrent somatic genome alterations target oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And I think, as, as, as most of you are aware, uh, most cancer-causing mutations are somatic. That is to say, they're present in the cancer DNA, but they are absent in the germline DNA. Of course, there are also important cancer germline risk mutations. Uh, the somatic alterations are of particular interest uh, because they can provide a large therapeutic window, uh, genome-targeted treatments can kill genomically altered cancer cells and spare uh, genomically normal cells. And uh, cancer genes, as you're all familiar with, um, fall into two major categories, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And uh, my uh, postdoctoral mentor, uh, Bob Weinberg, always analogized the oncogene to be like the accelerator of the car. Uh, and that's always stuck in the on position in the cancer cell, su suggested by these extra people pushing the car. And the tumor suppressor gene is a break, shown here by this rock, which is broken in the cancer cell as the tumor suppressor gene is, is inactivated. Um, so uh, Dr. Dr. Curry emphasized yesterday uh, in his inaugural address uh, the, em the importance of the humanities uh, for, uh, for a university and for all studies. And so just to... In that context, I want to quote here uh, from the first line of, of Leo Tolstoy's novel, Anna Karenina. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I actually don't necessarily think it's, it's necessarily true of, of people. I actually think there are many ways for a family to be happy or an individual to be happy or a, a university community uh, to be happy. But it is true in a way of our genomes, that is to say, Normal genomes are all mostly alike. We have, uh, almost all of us share the same 22 pairs of autosomes. We have the same genes in the same order, in the same dosage. 
um, with an occasional polymorphism among us uh, that helps lead to variation. But every cancer genome is abnormal in its own, own way. Some are haploid. Some might be, have, have five or six copies of, of every chromosome. Uh, some may have hundreds of copies of, of, of a gene or a region, and some may have zero copies. So this enormous variation uh, is really distinct, and, and it's just an incredible set of, of genome alterations from the host that are unique, and they may also vary within the cancer as it evolves. At the same time, these alterations are not random, but they occur in, in common pathways and, and mechanisms. Our work has been driven largely by the increasing power of genome sequencing technology. Uh, so many of you may be familiar with uh, Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore was uh, the found, one of the founders of Intel in, in Silicon Valley in California. And in the early 1960s, he said, the power of semiconductors doubles every 18 months. And this has been true just underlying this incredible revolution in, in um, uh, computer and communication technology that we've seen. But if we looked at the cost of genome sequencing, which is this green line, it's improved even faster than Moore's law. And so um, when I started my lab in Dana-Farber in, in 1998, the human genome was being sequenced, and that first human genome probably cost over a billion dollars. By 2001, the cost of a genome sequence was approaching $100 million, uh, and by the end of last year, approaching $1,000, a 100,000-fold improvement uh, over uh, 15 years, which is, is remarkable. And then shown here is the Illumina uh, four-color sequencing technology, and the penny is shown here just for scale. It's not the cost of genome sequencing yet, but if we just follow this line down, uh, maybe in a few years it will be. So I'm going to start by talking about a few general features of, of lung cancer genomes and then talk about driver mutations. Um, first, I, I think, um, as uh, Dr. Bunn mentioned in his talk, that uh, he decided to work on lung cancer because it was the leading cause of cancer death. And I think we've made a lot of progress, but this is still true today. Um, and uh, as of 2014, uh, in uh, um, the United States, figures from, from Dr. Brawley and colleagues at, at the American Cancer Society, uh, there are still over 150,000 uh, deaths per year from lung cancer in the United States alone, and over 1 million deaths per year uh, from lung cancer uh, worldwide. Uh, most cases of lung cancer are associated with smoking, uh, but many cases of lung adenocarcinoma in particular are not smoking associated. The lung cancers that arise in, in, in patients who are smokers are genomically deranged with very high mutation frequencies. So this is a slide from my colleague Mike Lawrence in collaboration with us on somatic mutation frequency in mutations per megabase of the genome, per million bases. Uh, on the uh, vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, uh, different cancer types. The lowest mutation rates found in pediatric cancers and hematopoietic malignancies, the highest mutation rates in carcinogen-driven cancers like melanoma, lung squamous carcinoma, and lung adenocarcinoma. Every dot here represents a sample with a mutation rate, and actually the very highest rate in colorectal cancers uh, and others with uh, uh, hypermutation syndromes. MSI or, or DNA polymerase mutations. These very high mutation rates uh, may underlie uh, the response of lung cancers uh, to uh, immunotherapy, and there was a very nice study by Nair Rizvi uh, last, uh, published last year uh, describing this correlation. I'm not going to talk more about the response to immunotherapy uh, for reasons of time. Uh, lung cancers are also characterized by common chromosomal arm level alterations. Here, red represents uh, copy number gain, uh, blue represents copy number loss, and white represents no change. Chromosomes are organized uh, in this dimension, and every thin vertical line represents a sample. And you can see, for example, uh, both adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas of the lung generally have gains of chromosome arm 1Q, losses of uh, 8P, and gains of 8Q. Um, squamous cell carcinomas in particular can characterized, for example, by loss of 3P and gains of 3Q. We don't know why these chromosome alterations occur. We don't know whether they're important for cancer, and we don't know whether they make a difference in cancer therapy. And so these are all really important open questions uh, for people to think about in, in cancer therapy. I'd now like to turn to talking about lung adenocarcinoma genes and their relationship to targeted therapies. Uh, first, I'll go back to some of our earlier work uh, in which uh, the systematic kinase sequencing of non-small cell lung cancers 
identified EGFR uh, mutations. Um, here, I think this project actually emphasizes the importance of international collaboration uh, because we sequence the activation loops of, of receptor tyrosine kinase genes in 62 lung cancer samples and match normal controls. We were actually very fortunate in our study uh, that all of the cases that we sequenced originally came from a colleague in Japan, a thoracic surgeon in Nagoya, Dr. Hidefumi Sasaki. In this case set, we identified somatic mutations in, in, in the epidermal growth factor receptor initially in non-smoking women with adenocarcinoma. And um, I just want to show you these mutations. Uh, there are four major groups in the nucle uh, nucleotide binding loop, exon 19 uh, insertion, uh, exon 19 deletions, exon 20 insertions, and mutations of the activation loop. All of these except those in the uh, exon 20 insertion uh, uh, mutants respond to gefitinib, and erlotinib, and afatinib. Um, I say that um, our study of samples from Japan turned out to be important because it looks like about 50% uh, of patients from East Asia uh, harbor EGFR mutations in their lung adenocarcinoma. Only about 10% uh, from Europe or North America or Australia. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the rates are in, in countries of the Middle East. Why is there this difference on a population level in somatic mutations? These are not inherited mutations. We don't know why there's this difference, and I think this question is open. And finally, I just want to mention our study with uh, Bruce Johnson and Pasayane and colleagues, led by Guillermo Paez, and simultaneously published studies from uh, Tom Lynch's group at um, the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and William Powell and Harold Varmus and colleagues uh, at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. As we've heard, and I'll, I won't linger, those patients with EGFR mutant lung, ad lung cancer benefit from gefitinib, while those with EGFR wild-type lung cancer do not benefit. This slide is shown from the IPASS study uh, from Tony Lutmach, but I won't linger on it because um, uh, Suresh Ramalingam and, uh, and others have shown this previously. And also, I won't linger on this slide, which uh, reiterates the finding of Paul Bunn and colleagues, that an overall genomic analysis in the lung cancer mutation consortium trial leads to improved survival, underscoring the importance of genomic diagnosis. Uh, in, in the treatment of lung cancer. I'm now going to turn to the landscape of significantly mutated genes in lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, and this is our most comprehensive published report to date uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, published in um, uh, 2014, uh, a study that um, uh, we led together with uh, colleagues around the United States and, and throughout the world. And these are the 18 most significantly mutated genes uh, in lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, most significant of all is P53 and then KRAS. There are today three genes that can effectively be targeted, EGFR of, of the mutated genes, EGFR, uh, BRAF, and MET, uh, of which only EGFR uh, inhib inhibitors have yet been validated uh, by clinical trials. Um, and if we take all of the receptor tyrosine kinase RAS, RAF drivers uh, at the time of this paper, about 75 percent of cases uh, show the presence of some driver. Uh, we expect that as we continue larger scale sequencing uh, programs, we're going to identify uh, oncogenic drivers in more cases, and I'll, I'll talk about one of those. The alternative splicing of MET exon 14, seen in the uh, RNA sequencing data from TCGA, this leads to skipping of exon 14, shown by the percent of exon 14 here, either with MET splice site mutation, mutations near the splice site, or in one case, an apparent stop code on inside the uh, exon 14 that leads uh, to elimination of a splice enhancer and, and skipping. So in two, 10 out of 230 cases, uh, we saw um, met exon 14 skipping. So this was actually not a new discovery. It was first published in 2006. But I think our discovery has catalyzed a number of clinical studies, uh, several studies published in the last year of responses of um, lung adenocarcinoma with metexon 14 splicing mutations to cruzotinib. This is a, a, a paper uh, from a, a group led by my colleague David Barbie at Dana-Farber. And you can see here uh, this lesion in the lungs uh, and uh, this um, abdominal lesion, a periaortic lesion, uh, both shrinking uh, within five weeks of cruzotinib therapy. Um, and so I think that it's important to really consider uh, the exon, met exon uh, 14 splicing 
lesions and clinical trials with crizotinib or other MET-focused inhibitors. Uh, another new genome alteration we identified comes from a lung cancer patient who responded to single-agent serafinib, uh, a patient of our, our, our colleague uh, David Carbone's. And you can see here, in fact, this patient was on hospice uh, at one point, and then um, she was part of the ECOG, a cooperative group, uh, 2501 trial um, uh, the, uh, that uh, set that Dr. Ramalingam was, was describing. And you can see her multiple lesions in the lung prior to treatment really resolved uh, with um, uh, serafinib therapy. Mechanism unknown, uh, Marcin and Malinsky in my group led a sequencing study of this, finding a novel mutation in the ARAF gene, S214C, and then used this to discover multiple recurrent mutations in both ARAF and RAF1 uh, in lung adenocarcinoma, also representing new therapeutic targets. MAP2K1 mutations, originally discovered by William Pau, are seen in about 1% of lung adenocarcinomas. Hugh Gannon in my lab led a study of um, uh, RNA interference data and found that um, ce a cell line with MAP2K1 mutation in lung adenocarcinoma is uniquely sensitive to map down of the MAP2K1 gene. And he showed similar findings using a CRISPR knockdown uh, compared in NCI H1437 to the A549 control cell harboring KRAS mutations. And then in, um, showed that uh, this mutant cell line uh, here in cell culture and also in xenografts, uh, NCI H1437, is uniquely sensitive uh, to trametinib. Uh, and so I think it's important to consider for these mutations uh, trials of trametinib and other uh, inhibitors. And then finally, translocations. And um, uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Bunn about uh, trials of, of ALK inhibitors. Uh, ALK and ROS1 uh, have both uh, translocations, both been shown uh, to be associated with clinical responses. Now a large number of different receptor tyrosine kinase uh, translocations, and I'm going to mention two from our, our submitted next uh, TCGA paper, uh, work led by Josh Campbell, of uh, two fusions of MET, a CAPZA2 fusion and a fusion with KIF5B, also the partner for RET fusions as well as fusions of NTRAC2 uh, in both uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma and lung squamous cell carcinoma, uh, following the very nice work on uh, NTRAC1 fusions recently uh, from Robert Doboli at the University of Colorado. So these are additional fusions that may also represent um, novel targets uh, for therapy of lung adenocarcinoma. So now I'd like to mention other significantly mutated genes in lung adenocarcinomas. I talked about the receptor tyrosine kinase ras raf pathway. Uh, Dr. Fadlo Curry, as you probably know well, has done extensive work on um, mTOR inhibition, including uh, Everolimus, uh, in the treatment of lung cancer, and two genes in the um, uh, pathway impinging on mTOR in the PI3 kinase pathway, SDK11, a tumor suppressor gene, one of the most commonly mutated genes in lung adenocarcinoma and the PI3 kinase catalytic subunit gene, PIK3CA, are on this list of highly mutated genes, which may affect the response to drugs such as Everolimus, as well as uh, direct PI3 kinase inhibitors. So just if we summarize, and I just also want to mention here, CDKN2A mutation and frequent amplifications and of cyclin D1 and cyclin E1 and CDK4. So just to, to summarize on new targets for clinical trials, MET is mutated in about 5% of lung adenocarcinomas and also translocated and is shown in the study by uh, uh, David Barbie and Mark Awad and colleagues may respond to crizotinib. MAP2K1 mutated in about 1% of lung adenocarcinomas may respond to trametinib or similar agents. NTRAC genes, rare translocations, you know, should be considered for investigational agents just like RET translocations and others. And RAF1 and, and ARAF mutations are mutated in about 1% of cases, um, uh, should be considered for RAF inhibitors, as of course should be the BRAF mutations, which we first reported in 2002, our first uh, somatic mutation finding in lung adenocarcinoma, in about 5% of, of cases. And finally, I think for targeted inhibitors, both the PI3 kinase pathway and cell cycle alterations need to be investigated. So I've talked about new targets for clinical trials, but I think we also need to think about new targets for So if we look at this list of mutated genes, there are almost no drugs targeting most of the mutated genes in lung adenocarcinoma. So I think this is a very nice introduction uh, to the upcoming talk on drug development uh, by my colleague, Dr. Hyun Fu. And finally, 
I, I usually acknowledge my colleagues um, uh, in my talks, but uh, here I'd like um, actually to acknowledge my father, uh, Martin Meyerson. And uh, Fadlo very kindly mentioned my father in his introduction, and, and, and like Fadlo, I, I, I feel like I, um, I come from a, a, a distinguished uh, academic origin. Um, my father was served as the president of the University of Pennsylvania and also the president of the uh, International Association of Universities. Uh, part of his real commitment uh, to uh, international collaboration and the view of, of really spreading universal knowledge among all of us uh, in a cooperative manner uh, all around the world. And uh, Fadlo made a very kind comment about his father and me. And so I just want to say that uh, uh, Fadlo, I think that you are the uh, intellectual and academic leader uh, that my father always dreamed that I would be. So thank you for, for uh, following my father's dream. Thank you, Dr. Meyerson, for this excellent talk. We appreciate it. I think for the interest of time, we're going to keep the questions till lunch. If anyone has a burning question, write it down, and we're going to move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Haiyan Fu. Dr. Fu is a professor of pharmacology at Emory University School of Medicine, and his research focuses on cancer genomics-based interrogation of protein-protein interactions for chemical biology studies. He's going to give us a very interesting talk on targeting the undruggable targets in cancer. Thank you, Dr. Fu, for being with us today. So I'm uh, honored to be part of the celebration of the 16th president of AUB, Dr. Fallo Curry, and the celebration of 150th anniversary of AUB. Uh, it is truly my privilege to have, have uh, been working with Dr. Curry for the past 12 years. And uh, so my talk actually will present uh, different, give you a different dimension of Dr. Curry, because my talk will represent our collaborative work. And before that, I just want to say congratulations to President Curry. And uh, so one thing I can be sure to you is through my interaction with him, he works very hard, always works very hard, and to push things forward and challenge himself, challenging everybody around him. But so far, nobody has talked about his uh, exceptional leadership in building a place, like he's the founding uh, chairman of the uh, hematology, medical oncology department at Emory from ground up, be make this department become, become one of the best in integrating basic research and the clinic together. So he is a visionary leader, no question. AUB did a fantastic job, uh, got him uh, here. Uh, here, so I'll show you some slides, um, uh, some pictures. Basically, it's from uh, our most <coughs> recent trip, just to illustrate one aspect. He always make collect connections. He always seeking new opportunities, and always new opportunity to bring people together. So here, i just show you, you know, one recent trip to China. He is in Shanghai. He did not you know, really enjoy his lunch, but enjoyed talking with Dr. Bill Ely, the, uh, the, the uh, executive director for uh, medical education from Emory. And you can see how serious they are talking about work. And here, he, he, uh, he was touring the, one of the top Chinese medical university in a me Chinese medicine pharmacy. He really got into you know, how does each uh, ingredient work, the philosophy of Chinese medicine. So you can see how serious they are. And the standing here, that's the best hospital in China, the Xiehe Hospital in Beijing. This is a new wing, so we've got a tour and to get a connection with the top university, uh, top hospital uh, in China and the top uh, medical school. And you can see here, he never stopped working. Even sitting in the car, transported from one place to other, he is connecting. And uh, very likely, this email he's testing is to UA, uh, AUB. <laughs> because at that time, he was, uh, you know, actually before he started, that was um, June, July, or June, <coughs> last June. So he already accepted job here, and he was always on the phone 
I'm sure with somebody at the AUB. And the texting, so you guys can tell, he did not start the job last September. He started way before September. So that's follow. I truly believe he not only will link AUB to the best in the world, he will lead the AUB to become one among the best. Congratulations, Dr. Curry. So now, this, the next part of the talk actually represents our joint um, research together and also reflect that his innovative part of his mind. He's a physician scientist, but he's a rare physician scientist with a true appreciation and understanding of the power of basic research and basic research integration with translational research. So we're talking about druggable genome. No, uh, Paula was talking about undruggable genome, but we'd like to start with introduction about druggable genome. Uh, it's great, uh, Dr. Myerson just already gave an introduction about druggable genome for lung can uh, for cancer. So we start with the human the genome. Basically, that's all the genetic materials that code in the functional component uh, that determines the uh, life, uh, blueprint of the life. So among those genes, there are a set of genes that are associated with disease. Like Dr. Meisen indicated, those somatic mutations in genes that causes cancer. So that's a fraction of genes, but not all the genes involved with disease can be targeted. So then there's a fraction of those genes associated with disease that can be targeted by a drug, like aspirin. Aspirin target cyclooxygenase. Right? So this another fraction of the genome, a gene that's associated with disease that can be targeted by drugs are defined as a druggable genome. So that the prediction is that the druggable genome occupies about 10% of the genome, but now we're only uh, targeting about 300-ish uh, in the, uh, our hum human genome as druggable. So what are those druggable genomes? Actually, you can see, so those are the drugs from the human genome, and um, you can see majority of uh, drug targets are CPCR. So that's, that's the most of the uh, drug target. So the, the, the top most targeted uh, genes, G-protein coupled receptors, ion channels, nuclear receptors, and kinases. Kinases has, has emerged as a major class mainly because of oncology. So Dr. Myerson already gave you an example about the pathways, about the targets uh, 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 that's important for nuclear the trial and for the uh, targeting. So he shows an updated pie uh, chart showing that you know, the kinases become the target for those new drugs. So clearly, cancer target, targets include the kinases. That's a major classes of kinases. So why that work? Again, Dr. Myerson already gave the introduction about the pathways. So it's not the individual protein that's important for disease. It is the function of the individual protein that transmits those signals to drive features that's required for tumor genesis. Like in this case, EGFR inhibitor, um, PS3 kinase inhibitor, RAF inhibitor, uh, MAP kinase uh, 2K, 2K1 inhibitor, the mTOR he mentioned uh, in his talk. So those proteins that transmit the signal from outside of cell into nucleus to drive cell proliferation. So currently, those proteins are targeted, uh, become part of the druggable genome uh, as a kinase. So now, here are some challenges. Dr. Myerson said that a cancer genome study indicates that most of the cancer drivers actually non-enzymes. So what we just heard from the previous talks, most of the targets for in clinic trial now are enzymes. Most of them are kinases. But in reality, most of the cancer drivers, they are not enzymes, basically. Proteins with no known catalytic activity. Another challenge is that most drugs now target oncogenes, right? Elk, 
BRAF, EGFL. Those are oncogenes. They are activated, like the car Dr. Myerson trying to push, right? So those are activated oncogenes. They drive the car away. However, majority of cancer drivers actually are tumor suppressor genes. So those are lost of function. So it's difficult, very challenging for therapeutic targeting. So you target something that's lost in cancer. Although those are the best marker for differentiating tumors from uh, normal cells. So those are challenges. So that define undruggable target space. So enzymes, usually people are non-enzymes, not, not usually considered as undruggable. And the tumor suppressors are usually considered undruggable. So how do we deal with those large space that's challenging, still no, uh, no options? So what we believe is, is that we can target those undruggables through protein-protein association to see how they associate with something which we can target. So that's the start of our work you know, in collaboration with Dr. Curry. That is, we want to target those undruggable genomes that include those protein-protein interaction interface and those tumor suppressors. For example, RAS, RAF interaction that transmit signals in many tumors. So people kind the technology, the druggable genome, target individual proteins, like RAF inhibitor, kinase inhibitor. We're trying to in, uh, the interfere, we're trying to target the interface between those proteins, basically block the signal transmission in the pathway. And another example, it's a very established example, is between P53 and MDM2, that transmit a signal to suppress tumor genesis. So if we can find a way to interfere with this interface between these two proteins, we may find a way to deal with a larger space in the undruggable genome. In order to do that, we establish a technology platform at Emory, mostly based on Emory Chemical Biology Discovery Center. And Dr. Curry and I, we co-leaded the center in two national activities, uh, initiatives. One is NCI Chemical Biology Consortium. So our center mostly focuses on those undruggable genome protein-protein interaction targets to, to, uh, be, uh, to be part of the NCI's machine, machine, drug discovery machine for cancer drug discovery. The second initiative we are involved in is cancer target discovery and the development network. So that work is totally built, built on the cancer genomics work pioneered and uh, driven by Dr. Meissen's uh, uh, work just presented. So today, I will present to you one small story from our work in this so-called CTD square uh, network to, to demonstrate how we utilize cancer genomics information for future drug discovery, at least leading to the uh, new direction. So the, our project basically is using high-throughput technology to interrogate protein-protein interactions in cancer. So we hypothesized that tumor-associated genomic alterations, as present, uh, presented by Dr. Myerson, transmit signals through these protein-protein uh, interactions, and those hubs that integrate those tumorgenic pathway to exert tumor transformation phenotype. If we can identify those critical protein-protein interactions in the pathway, we can identify ways to dis disrupt, perturb such pathway, leading to disrupted uh, uh, transformation phenotype. So our goal is to identify new targets through protein-protein interaction network mapping. Use the map to prioritize the protein-protein interaction as a target. Towards this goal, we established Oncopy network, that is cancer gene, cancer-associated gene-mediated protein-protein interaction network. Without getting any, into any details, basically briefly, so we, based on cancer genomics information as published by Dr. Myerson and his uh, uh, co uh, collaborators and, uh, and uh, the colleagues, so from this data, we identify genes that are important for lung cancer in this case, then put it into a, a set of expression vectors. Then use our robotic system 
AUB has a great engineering system, uh, engineering uh, uh, college, uh, college here. So basically, we combine the power of engineering to, for high throughput screening, then characterize pairwise interaction to see which protein interact with each other. Now from here, using statistical analysis to identify those positive interactions to establish the network of new cancer-associated interaction. So that network of protein-protein interactions based on cancer genome, we call it, we define this network as Oncopy. So here shows some uh, uh, hubs important in this network, like a MIC hub, LAS2, STK11, uh, that's lost in cancer, uh, in lung cancer. So now, we utilize this network as a tool. Number one is to define what interaction is important for cancer as a new target for drug discovery. So today, I will focus on the second application, that is, use the network as a tool to link those undruggable tumor suppressor with druggable target, then to the drug. How we do that? First, we place those tumor suppressors in green in the network, like STK11, that's 2 RAS-SF1, and P53. So then link those tumor suppressors with actionable drug target, like STK11 with CDK4, like Ruth Auric and already talked about, that has a drug in clinic, trial, uh, in clinic for breast cancer. So link tumor suppressors with actionable target then link those targets with available drugs. Like uh, RB2, there are several approved drugs in clinic. So that way, we can link those undruggable tumor suppressors to druggable targets and to the drug. Then use one example, STK11, or called LKB1, link CDK4. It has a drug, Pepocyclin. So this connectivity led us to explore whether the LKB status may be associated with drug sensitivity to the drug that's linked to CDK4. And this is our new hypothesis, but just cut a long story short to show yes indeed. And loss of LKB1 showed increased sensitivity to pebble if you put the LKB1 back, you induce the resistance. So the level of LKB1 seems to be associated with the sensitivity of lung cancer uh, to pyrocyclic. So that's approved for breast cancer. So now this work led to a next step, that is the clinical uh, investigation. Uh, Tafik Onyokuku actually is sitting in the audience. He is leading, uh, integrating this basic research result into his clinical trial in lung cancer using this uh, drug. So now, this is leading to a new program that is now whether we can exploit this LKB1 status in lung cancer to develop new therapeutic agents. So this is leading to a second lung cancer program project. So actually, I want to point out, so this program is built on the uh, phase one not the clinical trial phase one, but it's the first step of lung cancer program uh, at Emory, led by Dr. Fallo Curry. That's one of ma his uh, major accomplishments at Emory, is to build the lung cancer program with a large uh, uh, program supported by the NCI. So our current work is the second phase. So his impact will remain at Emory, although AUB have him here. So finally, just use this as a summary. From genomics, we establish rewide protein-protein interaction network. From the network, we identify important protein-protein interaction interface as a drug target. So at the same time, we use network to inform new therapeutic strategies like STK11, CDK4 inhibitor. So those uh, identified targets will go through high throughput screening like the, the, with the capability we have in the chemical biology center to identify new compounds that go back for genomics-based uh, precision oncology. And as I just briefly mentioned, the collaboration will be continued with AUB. I will end here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Fu. Our next speaker is Dr. Alan Shahade, and he is a professor of mechanical engineering at the American University of Beirut. He studies chemistry, physics, and effects of airborne particle pollutants. Researchers worldwide use his instruments and methods. He and his team developed at AUB to study tobacco smoke. Dr. Shahade advises the WHO is a project director at the VCU Center for the Study of Tobacco Products and directs the AUB Aerosol Lab. His talk is entitled Exploring New Tobacco Threats. Welcome, Dr. Shahade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm honored uh, to be speaking on the occasion of AUB's 150th anniversary, and I'm especially honored to be speaking on the occasion of Dr. Khoury's inauguration as our new president. Um, I'm also honored to be speaking at a symposium on cancer with a distinguished group of scholars who know much more than I on, on the subject, and I'm humbled to be on here, up here with, uh, with them. Uh, finally, I would like to express my great, great pleasure, pleasure uh, to be speaking again to my colleagues in the Faculty of Medicine. It's uh, been very nice collaborating with you over the past 15 years, and I always feel like this is kind of a second home to me. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. Uh, Dr. Thomas Eisenberg at VCU, Dr. Wasim Maziak at uh, Florida International University and the Syrian Center for Tobacco Studies. Uh, Dr. Marwan Sabban, who thankfully is sitting up here in the second row, he can answer some difficult questions. Dr. Najat Saliba in chemistry and Dr. Ghazi Zatari, who I think left. All right, so I was asked to talk about uh, new tobacco threats and um, before I begin, I, I would like to mention some background on the origins of lung, of lung cancer. Lung cancer really, as an epidemic, begins with the advent of the modern cigarette. And the modern cigarette has a few key uh, uh, time points in its history. One of them is flu curing, and that's probably the most important one to the audience here. Flu curing is a process of treating or heating the tobacco while it's being cured to a high temperature which kills bacteria, which allows the sugar content of the leaf to be preserved. And when the sugar content is preserved, when the leaf is burned, uh, the pH of the smoke is lower, and it's much more inhalable. It's actually the key innovation that allows smoke to be inhaled into the lungs. And without that, um, we would probably have a r quite a bit lower incidence of lung cancer in the world. Um, the other innovations that are mentioned there, safety matches, um, it's kind of obvious nowadays that you, know, you, you need something to light a cigarette if you're going to smoke a cigarette, but that, that was uh, in, uh, not until 1855 that those were invented. Um, and then the Bonsack rolling machine, 1881. So that is the first automated machine that rolled cigarettes automatically. It made 100,000 cigarettes an hour, and that allowed cigarettes to be mass produced. So the combination of flu curing, safety matches, and the rolling machine, those are kind of innovations by engineers uh, that ended up producing a disaster. And I would like to make a shout out today also to my engineering students who are here. I'm supposed to be lecturing at this hour in thermodynamics, and I, I asked them to come and learn a little bit about cancer. And finally, mass advertising. Um, and you can see an advertisement there, do you inhale? That's kind of uh, calling back the fact that cigarettes are inhalable at that time. Uh, but it's also important to note that in the U.S. alone, $900,000 an hour are spent on marketing uh, cigarettes. And that's in a country where radio, TV, magazine advertising is illegal. Um, so, you know, lest you think that this is a, a problem of the past, I pulled up Philip Morris's, one of Philip Morris's uh, many annual reports. And these two smiling gentlemen are, are proud to say that they delivered solid results in 2013 despite an extremely challenging operating environment. The price of oil was high. It turns out that when oil is high, cigarette sales are low, and of course now we have the opposite problem, and that has to do with the price of gasoline. Um, but in any case, they, they made uh, $8 billion that year in profits. Their sales were $80 billion, not including the U.S. And of course, when I see those smiling faces, I get tempted to put a box over them and do another calculation. This, this calculation is not included in the uh, PMI report. It's what is the value of a human life to a cigarette manufacturer. It's actually a really simple order of magnitude calculation. If you take uh, that they sell six trillion cigarettes a year, uh, divide that by six million deaths a year, premature deaths caused by smoking, and their average profit is one penny 
for a cigarette comes out to $10,000 per life. That's the value of life to the big tobacco industry. And you can compare that to what it costs to treat a cancer patient for one year. So it might be better to buy off this mafia, give, give them $10,000, and tell them not to sell that product anymore. Thank you. Um, in most places in the world, cigarette consumption is actually decreasing. Um, there are two places in the world where it is not. China is one of them, and it's the major growth market for the tobacco industry. And the second one, unfortunately, is our region, the Emerald region. It's one of the highest growing, although it's, it's shown to be low there in terms of consumption. That's just because of the population figures. Uh, it's actually one of the fastest growing uh, consumption, cigarette consumption markets in the globe. Um, and so that leads me to the new threats, the subject of this talk. Um, I, as I see it, there are three major threats. One of them is the rollback of tobacco control. Um, as I mentioned, tobacco smoking is on the decline in most regions of the world, and that's due to uh, policies that have been put in place to limit the availability of tobacco to youth, to uh, increase taxation, make them more expensive, to li limit advertising, and so on. And um, one of the big uh, problems with that now are trade agreements, bilateral, multilateral trade agreements. Some of you might have heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is currently being negotiated. These trade agreements give corporations uh, rights. They give them the rights to sue governments that have policies that may interfere with their profits. And there are several ongoing cases. Australia is a very well-known one. Australia, in December of 2012, uh, forced all manufacturers to have plain packaging. They could no longer use uh, package designs, and they, in fact, forced them to put graphic images of uh, tobacco-diseased people or organs on the front of the uh, packaging. The tobacco industry, of course, went crazy. They took them to, uh, the, to court twice inside uh, of Australia, all the way to the High Court of Australia. They lost those two cases. They then, then uh, moved Philip Morris, very interestingly, moved its headquarters of sales for Australia uh, to Hong Kong because there happens to be a bilateral trade agreement between Hong Kong and Australia, and that agreement says that uh, Australia will not seize any property or uh, trademarks of uh, products sold from Hong Kong. Uh, so they, on that basis, they said that uh, the Australian government has basically taken over the trademarks that they've spent so much money developing, and they uh, took them to what is called um, a... Uh, Investor State Dispute Settlement Tribunal. And that's a tribunal of three lawyers who are appointed, not elected. And they hear the case. They hear the two sides. They hear the corporation side, and then they hear the government side. It so happened that not on the basis that they're allowed to um, uh, enforce plain packaging, but on the basis that Philip Morris had only nine months earlier moved their operation specifically for the purpose of enacting this, uh, of calling into affect this bilateral trade agreement, it was on that basis that this ISDSS uh, rejected the case. That happened only last month. There is now a World Trade Organization dispute um, being brought against Australia for the same reason. So the point is that um, these, uh, these trade agreements are a major threat to to global tobacco control, and they haven't only had an impact on Australia, they've had an impact on much smaller countries which have tried to take the same measures that Australia have but find themselves uh, completely outgunned by large uh, tobacco corporations. Um, the second new threat are electronic cigarettes. That's something we're working on a lot at AUB, but I'm not going to talk about it much today. I'll just mention one reason why I think it's a new threat, um, and that is that it renormalizes smoking. It allows again, advertising to be put in magazines, on TV and movies uh, for smoking, but it doesn't, th these are electronic cigarettes, not, not burnt tobacco cigarettes. It also reintroduces the notion that you can be sitting in a restaurant with someone puffing away next to you. You know, I'd like to think that my children would grow up thinking that's an unusual uh, thing to do, to light up a cigarette in an indoor place, like even in this room. Um, but, but electronic cigarettes are renormalizing it. And they advertise them specifically because they allow you to smoke anywhere. You can see the advertisement in the middle. It says freedom to smoke virtually anywhere. Or uh, alternatively, why quit? Why should you quit? Go ahead and just smoke these instead. And the third uh, threat and the final threat are water pipes. And that's a subject we've been working on a lot here at AUB for the past uh, 15 years. Um, it's 
you know, one reason it's important to study it is that it's a global epidemic. It's virtually in every region of the world, Eastern Europe, Latin America, of course, this, this region of the world, the U.S., um, and it's growing in time, and it's particularly attractive to youth because of its sugared, flavored characteristics. Um, the second reason is that uh, it's good to brag about AUB on the 150th anniversary, and, and it turns out that AUB is the world uh, center for uh, tobacco research. This was uh, of water pipe tobacco research. This was a bibliometric analysis published in 2014, ranking AUB as number one in the world on this subject. So let's get on to water pipe toxicants and health effects. There are several questions that we've been asking over the past few years. The first one was the most obvious. Does the water pipe, does water pipe smoke contain toxicants? Um, the second question was, all right, well, if it does contain toxicants, do users absorb a significant proportion of those toxicants? The third was, well, what happens if they do absorb them? What happens to the user when they smoke a water pipe? Fourth question is, what happened to the user after they smoked it for some time? And finally, what about water pipe smoking? Does it emit toxicants? So if you're not smoking it yourself, but sitting next to someone who's smoking it, are you exposed to a significant dose of, of toxicants? Um, so this research has kind of spanned from the molecule all the way up to population health. And of course, it's not me alone. Uh, this is involving many teams at AUB and beyond. Um, let me start for, those are, uh, for our guests who may not be too familiar with the water pipe. Uh, the water pipe is a device that's been smoked for a while, for hundreds of years actually, not only with tobacco. Um, in, the, in the form that it's currently uh, quite popular, it involves uh, loading a head uh, with tobacco and then putting charcoal on top of it, and then puffing. You suck from the mouthpiece. Uh, when the user draws from the mouthpiece, air is drawn over the coal. The coal heats up, it combusts more rapidly. That heat then goes into the tobacco, it vaporizes, pyrolyzes the tobacco, um, and that smoke then goes through the water and it bubbles through it and it provides a bubbling sensation which is part of the sensory experience that water pipe users um, like the most or they report that they like the most. It's quite different than the cigarette in that the tobacco burn is not self-sustaining. Uh, so the tobacco temperatures are quite a bit lower than what you see with a cigarette. We've measured the tobacco temperature. Um, it involves a heavy dose of flavorings. About two-thirds of the tobacco mixture is our flavorants. They're not tobacco. Um, and that the puff maneuver is quite different. It involves an order of magnitude larger puff volume. Finally, and most importantly, like the early cigarettes when, when once they became flu-cured, water pipe smoke is deeply inhalable. It's this cool, smooth, humidified smoke, relatively low pH, very easy to draw directly into the lungs. And if you notice, if you watch someone smoking a water pipe, they'll breathe essentially through the hose. They will draw the smoke directly into the lung. A cigarette smoker will typically fill the mouth cavity with the smoke and then inhale a bolus of air to push the smoke into the lung. So it's a, it's a very different puffing maneuver. Tobacco smoke is an aerosol. It means that it contains, uh, it con consists of a gas phase and a particle phase. The particle phase are typically nanometer sized uh, droplets of condensed hydrocarbons, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, metals, and, and many other constituents. We call that typically tar, but tar is not really a chemical compound, it's just a legal definition of 4,000 plus different compounds. And it's that particulate matter that makes smoke visible. The reason you can see smoke is that you have uh, you know, this material condensing as it cools, as it leaves the tip of a cigarette or the mouth of a, of a smoker. And it's that tar that contains the preponderance of the carcinogens, including the lung carcinogens, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which are very powerful lung carcinogens, as well as uh, bladder carcinogens. So do water pipes emit toxicants? If you read the labeling on the, on the package of uh, tobacco that you buy, uh, you would think that, well, maybe it doesn't contain any toxicants. It has some nicotine, but it says 0% tar. And almost universally, they say 0% tar on the packaging. And technically, that's true. Uh, there is actually no tar in that package because that package hasn't been burned yet. Once it's burned, there'll be plenty of tar. And so if we don't want to believe the, the advertising, we need to do some investigation ourselves. And it involves three basic steps. I'm simplifying it, but I think this works. Uh, we need to find out how people smoke water pipes. 
we need to program a robot to smoke the same way, and then we need to analyze that smoke for toxicants. And those are the basic three steps that we've done at AUB. Uh, to find out how people smoke, we had to develop some instruments that would uh, allow us to measure every puff that a person takes in, in a cafe or in a restaurant or, in a, or at home. Uh, that's called a puff topography instrument. Um, and, we, and what's shown there at, at the bottom is a record of four different puffs that might have been drawn by a user. Um, and that we can take that data and, av and get average puff topography for a population of users, users in cafes, young female users at home, etc. And then we can take that data and play it back through our smoking robot, which we developed here at AUB also. It essentially, just like you record a sound with a tape recorder, you can play it back. We do the same thing with our smoking robot. So we can get realistic smoke. So what we found out is that water pipe does indeed can contain toxicants. Um, it contains the traditional ones, tar, nicotine, and CO. And what's shown here in red is the water pipe, and what's shown in black are typical figures for a single cigarette. Uh, you can see that you do indeed get, in a, in a one-hour smoking session, quite a bit more tar, nicotine, and CO than you would get from a single cigarette. Um, and the same is true for just about all the toxicants that we measured, except for tobacco-specific nitrosamines. So we have high levels of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, lung carcinogens, high uh, levels of aldehydes. These are carbonyl compounds, which lead to COPD and other lung diseases, uh, high levels of heavy metals, and uh, relatively lower levels compared to the other toxicants of tobacco-specific nitrosamines. We found out that the particles themselves are very small. They're nanoparticles in the same size range as cigarette smoke, uh, around 150 uh, nanometer count mean diameter. We found out, and actually Marwan Saban found out, that they're biologically active. He uh, took smoke samples that we gave him, put them on cells, human aortic, uh, endothelial aortic cells, and uh, found a whole series of uh, a mechanism that would ultimately could lead to vascular diseases uh, involving oxidative stress, inflammation, cell cycle arrest, uh, et cetera, and also impaired cell function. So uh, Marwan here provided these uh, uh, Slides, they show on the left the control. So those, um, those are cells making normal uh, tubes, which would lead to vessels, blood vessels. And on the right, when they've been treated with water pipe smoke condensates, they no longer form those. So it, impair, it impairs uh, cell function. All right, does the user inhale toxicants? Obviously, yes. Uh, we do know that during a single water pipe use session, the user inhales large, a large dose of toxicants known to cause tobacco-related diseases. Um, we also know that the particle size distribution is similar to, uh, to cigarette smoke, and so we would expect similar deposition patterns in the human lung. And we know that water pipe smoke damages and interferes with repair mechanisms of lung and vascular cells. I didn't show you the lung cells, but he, Marwan did that as well. All right, well, do they absorb these toxicants? I mean, maybe they inhale them and they just exhale them back out again. And so we want to look at what's in the smoker. And so we took, this is uh, with my colleagues at VCU, we took uh, water, experienced water pipe users, had them smoke in the lab while we have a catheter hooked up in their arm, and we looked at the carbon monoxide and nicotine levels in the blood versus time as they're smoking. And you can see that there are uh, significant rises in both CO and plasma nicotine for these 31 participants. And those same 31 participants were also cigarette smokers. So we had them come in on a different day and smoke a cigarette. And these were what they had when they uh, smoked a cigarette. You can see that the CO level is much higher. Even in five minutes of smoking a water pipe, that's already much, much higher levels of CO than uh, one would be exposed to from smoking a cigarette for five minutes. And the plasma nicotine peaks much more quickly with the cigarette than it does with the, with the water pipe. But the actual area under the curve for the nicotine is in favor of the water pipe. The total dose is actually higher with the water pipe. Um, the nicotine is physiologically active, so we see uh, nicotine-dependent rises in uh, heart rate, and in heart rate, which is a uh, well-known well effect of nicotine. And if you notice in this slide, I mentioned placebo. We had, uh, we had to make sure that we weren't just seeing the effect of time. So we give uh, those same participants um, a flavor-matched product that had no nicotine in it. And uh, it's called Soex, and it's marketed here in Lebanon. And it says that it provides the same flavorful smoke found in other shisha, but without the harmful effects of tobacco. And it's true, it had no tobacco in it. But we found out that it essentially had 
everything else other than tobacco in the smoke. It was virtually identical also in terms of its biological effects on cells, in terms of its uh, effects in, in the body. It was essentially identical. So um, this healthy smoke is not healthy at all, actually. It just doesn't give you nicotine. Um, why might that be? Why, why isn't tobacco important? Well, one of the reasons it may not be that important is charcoal. So we've looked at the importance of charcoal in producing carcinogens and toxicants in the smoke. And um, we did that by, um, well, first of all, we, we noted that more charcoal is actually consumed during a smoking session than is tobacco. So if you actually weigh the amount of charcoal that they use and weigh the amount of tobacco they use, they're mainly smoking charcoal and it's flavored by tobacco, not the other way around. And so one would expect that charcoal has an important role. And we investigated this by developing a device, an electrical heating device, that would mimic the temporal and spatial patterns of a charcoal, uh, a block of charcoal. And then we measured uh, the carbon monoxide and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, volatile aldehydes, and other compounds. And we found out that charcoal is responsible for something like 90% of the carbon monoxide and more than 95% of benzoapyrene, which is the uh, notorious uh, lung carcinogen. So charcoal is an extremely important uh, player in the uh, toxic in production of water pipe smoke. And that might explain why it doesn't matter too much if there's tobacco there in the first place or not. Now, I, I should put a caveat on that, and that, that is that nicotine is an important uh, factor in smoking, and it's the main reason people continue to smoke. Dr. Shahid, um, can, we we can we please ask you to... Yes, sure, yeah, I can Thank you so up. much. I'll just go straight to the last thing, which is, um, what about secondhand smoke? We're always asked that, and, and a court case came up in Vancouver. They asked us to look at this question, and so we developed a fancy setup, and we found out that if you need to remove, if you have to remove someone, I mean, in, in Vancouver, they had, uh, they allowed cigarette smokers to smoke in, uh, they didn't allow cigarette smokers to smoke, but they allowed water pipe users to smoke in cafes. And so if, uh, the question was, do you have to kick out the cigarette smoker? Or do you have to kick out the water pipe smoker? And I'm sad, sorry to say for uh, some of our friends who smoke here a lot, um, it's actually in favor of the cigarette smoker. So if cigarettes should be, uh, should be banned from indoor spaces, then definitely, definitely water pipes should also be banned from indoor places for the exact same reason. And in fact, a water pipe smoker releases the equivalent of two to 10 cigarette smokers worth of these key toxicants into the air. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. And stop there. Thank you, Dr. Shahadi, for illuminating talk. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Jean-Pierre Issa. He is director of cancer research, Temple University, Philadelphia, and. Um, his laboratory is involved in basic and translational research in the field of molecular epigenetics. He will talk to us about epigenetics as a diagnostic and therapeutic tool for cancer. Welcome. Thank you, and um, thank you to the organizers for this uh, opportunity to be here. It's a real honor for me to be here. Um, you've heard a lot about Fudlow already, and I could embarrass him a lot more than some of the other speakers, but. Uh, I think he's had enough embarrassment uh, for a while. I, I did, though, want to mention that uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm a physician scientist is Fadlo's father. Uh, his father was dean of the medical school when I was in the medical school here, or a little over 30 years ago now, and he was a wonderful dean, a great teacher. He kept the medical school together during the war and was really a role model for people like uh, myself, who was interested in both lab research and clinical research. And so. Uh, I only met Fudlo uh, later when uh, we both were at MD Anderson and we both were relatively young faculty members there and we bonded over you know, what young faculty members uh, bond about which is complain about the administration and so Fudlo, now you are the administration so <laughs> hopefully none of the faculty would have anything to complain about. <laughs> but. <laughs> So anyway, I'm, I'm going to tell you today about some of our research on, on, uh, on epigenetics. And, and I'm, uh, I was asked by the organizers to take special care to make it understandable, because apparently epigenetics is hard to understand. So I will explain it to you in a very simple way and just show you uh, a couple of examples of how 
it is relevant to uh, health, uh, public health and also oncology and hopefully uh, uh, won't take too much uh, uh, time here. Just as a reminder, epi comes from the Greek, uh, means above genetics, and, and epigenetics is a term that was coined by developmental biologists in the 1950s that uh, really became essentially the science of cellular identity. And so I, I'd like to use a couple of examples to show you that. This is a picture of my kids a long time ago, unfortunately. And what, what you see when you look at a human face uh, is, is you see a lot of different tissues. You see, you see skin, you see hair, you see teeth, you see eyes, and you can imagine the internal organs. In fact, the human body has more than 200 different distinct tissue cell types, yet they all have exactly the same genetics. It's exactly the same complement of genes in each different cell type, yet each cell type is very stable and, and skin doesn't turn, in, in, into, doesn't turn into blood and doesn't turn into lungs and so on. And so the processes that make, that determine cellular identity work on top of the genome, and this is what we refer to as the epigenome. And one of the remarkable things that have uh, uh, arisen over the past few years is the idea that there can be also variation in the epigenome. And this is best exemplified in this mouse model, the pseudo Aguti mouse model, where you see six mice that are all at this point healthy. And there's really nothing unusual about these mice. They, range in color from yellow on the left to brown on the right. The only thing that's unusual is all these mice are identical twins. They have exactly the same genetics. And yet, the mouse on the left, which is yellow, will grow to become obese, develop diabetes, and develop cancer, while the mouse on the right will not, even though they have exactly the same genes. So the difference is epigenetic in that case, and this has led a lot of people to be interested in the role of epigenetics in, in, in health and disease as well. Now, what brings me here is the simple observation that the epigenome is very massively altered in cancer, and I won't give you a lot of the details for that because they're superfluous for this talk, but we measure the epigenome using marks that characterize either DNA or histones, the proteins around which DNA is wrapped, and uh, these marks are essentially very abnormal in cancer, and you see here just an example of, of, of acute myelogenous leukemia, but this could be really any cancer, and this is DNA methylation. And what we find, and many people find, and the TCGA has found this universally in all cancers, is that all cancers have abnormalities in their epigenomes. And of course, this is not surprising to cancer biologists because we have known for a long time that cancer is a disease of cellular identity. But now we essentially know why. And the epigenome alterations have also been traced in part to a lot of mutations that happen in cancer. You've heard a lot about activating mutations and kinases and driver mutations. And it turns out that a lot of the driver mutations in cancer um, are actually mutations that affect the epigenome, either DNA methylation regulators or histone regulators. But a common theme in cancer regulation is that really it's not just about addiction to oncogenes, but it's really a very fundamental disorder in cellular identity, which is caused in part by these massive alterations in the epigenome in cancer cells here. Now, one of the things that my lab has uh, uh, been uh, worried about for a number of years now is, is why does this arise? How and how does this arise? And we've been studying DNA methylation, and what we have found is that DNA methylation is a process that we are born with, but then that changes over time. And really the most fundamental factor that is driving epigenomic changes in cancer is actually simply aging. It is not cancer at all. And what we have found is that no matter what we do, even if we live in a bubble essentially, there is a standard rate of change where we acquire epigenomic abnormalities over time, uh, a process that has been referred to as epigenetic drift. And this turns out to be a fundamental feature of all aging, at least in all organisms that have DNA methylation. And we can trace the lifespan of a species based on how quickly the epigenome changes. And the reason humans live to be 100 is because the epigenome changes much more slowly than, say, in mice that only live to about two or three years here. 
And one of the important health uh, 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 implications and, and health findings is that the rate of change can be influenced by the environment. For example, you heard about smoking earlier. Um, any process that uh, induces chronic inflammation is actually going to make the epigenome change faster. And this is, of course, important because that could be one of the links between these exposures and disease states. And uh, disease states here is cancer, but of course, as you can imagine, this is happening in pretty much all our cells, at least all our cells that are dividing, and this could have implications for other diseases as well, including things like um, age-associated diabetes or neurodegeneration and so on. And one of the important interventional uh, 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 implications of the work is not just to identify what can actually drive it faster, but identify what can drive it slower. And we've recently found that there are things one can do to actually slow down the rate of epigenetic accumulation. And one of the things that uh, does that, and unfortunately for me, is calorie restriction. And, and so this is one of the things that actually universally prolongs life in animal models. And it may be doing that in part by dampening the rate of epigenetic change with age. OK, so another story I want to tell you very quickly about is uh, uh, the rising era of precision medicine. And, and you've heard about these plans to introduce genomic medicine and genomic testing to AUB. And, and so the, the, the dominant feature now of precision medicine is that we want to sequence everything. And it turns out, however, that there are actually a lot more epigenetic abnormalities in cancer cells than genetic abnormalities. And a lot of these can be sequenced and quantitated. And in some cases, they provide more information than genetic information. Here, I'm showing you DNA methylation analysis of a pathway that is linked to mutations in leukemias. This is the TET DNA demethylase pathway. By measuring DNA methylation of a handful of genes, these correspond to enhancer, we can identify a group of patients that have a very good outcome or reasonably good outcome after chemotherapy and a group of patients that has a very poor outcome after standard chemotherapy in AML. And you would think that perhaps precision medicine would need to measure that to assign these patients higher doses of chemo and these patients transplant. But actually, when you look at mutations in the pathway, none of the mutations was predictive of this differential outcome. And really, the best prediction, if you will, was a model that incorporated both epigenetic information and genetic information. And so it is at least our belief that in leukemias, where all of this done has been work in my lab, uh, all of this work has been done in my lab has been in leukemias, that really an integrated model of both epigenetic and genetic information is the way of the future. And um, the uh, final thing that I will mention as, as a potentially a key application of epigenetic information is the idea that the epigenome can actually be reset. And, and during life, the epigenome is reset only once, and this is reset in very early embryogenesis. In fact, uh, life starts by this fusion of a spermatozoan and an oocyte, and then an immediate drop in DNA methylation, and more than 99% drop in DNA methylation that happens in the first few days of life, and which is absolutely essential for creating the embryonic cells, the embryonic stem cells that are going to give rise to the organism. So there is this idea then that we can reset the epigenome. It is done during embryogenesis. And cancer biologists in the 1960s and 70s showed quite remarkably in a series of experiments that were largely forgotten by cancer geneticists that you can also reset the cancer phenotype by going through embryogenesis. So this started in this paper in 1969 where a, a, a frog cancer could actually lead to a completely normal frog simply by taking those cells and putting them in an embryonic environment. And you know, this particular veterinarian concluded in 1969 that cancer is an epigenetic disease. And this remains true today. A lot of the cancer phenotypes can actually be reversed by reversing this disorder of cellular identity. And we know that oncogenic driver mutations by themselves as isolated events do not cause cancer. They need other things in order to cause cancer. And we think a lot of these other things are epigenetics. And as a result, this has led to a field of epigenetic therapy, which is essentially targeting epigenetic proteins that establish and read the marks and try to target them to reprogram a cancer cell and use that as a cancer therapy. 
And of course, uh, uh, this field has exploded over the past decade with every major drug company having a drug development effort in epigenetics. There are broad acting general reprogrammers that target DNA methylation, histone deacetylation, and the readers of, of histone acetylation proteins called BET. There are more targeted uh, 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 mutations that have been uh, 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 targets for drug development, and I'm just giving you some examples here. One of the things that we have done is work with DNA methylation inhibitors, and uh, this is a phase one, two study that we have done where we have used DNA methylation as an endpoint for these studies and showed that as we increase the dose of this new drug called guadecitabine, we demethylate the genome until we reach a dose at which point there is no longer any additional benefit to increasing the dose. We established, therefore, what we refer to here as the biologically effective dose. And in the expansion studies, this drug turns out to be quite effective in patients with myeloid leukemia and patients with treatment naive AML or MDS has response rates of over 50% to single agent guadecitabine, some of these responses lasting more than two years right now. So this is an exciting new development in the field. This is a second generation DNA methylation inhibitor that has just entered phase three studies in the treatment of patients with AML. And as I mentioned, this is an exploding area of research with dozens of drugs in clinical trials. One can also use this to repurpose drugs. This is a screen, an epigenetic screen of an FDA-approved library that was done in my lab where we looked to ask, where we asked whether drugs that are currently in use for various disorders had epigenetic effects. We rediscovered the known epigenetic drugs, but in one very interesting finding that is shown here, we found that cardioglycosides, which have been used for many years in cardiology, turned out to have very prominent epigenetic effects in the system, which may explain many preclinical studies that have shown that cardiac glycosides are actually anti-cancer drugs, and some epidemiologic observations that have shown that people who take cardiac glycosides have lower incidence or mortality from cancers, and we're now repurposing cardiac glycosides as anti-leukemia agents in <coughs> clinical trials here. And so I want to finish just with one final example of epigenetics, uh, which is, I, I think, one of the most fascinating examples because it really opens a very uh, 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 new area of research, and this is, uh, uh, this, is, this, this, this is the queen bee. So in this uh, slide here, I'm showing you a queen bee and worker bees. The queen bee has been fluorescently marked here. Uh, because there's really, at, at this point, uh, uh, no distinguishing features of the queen bee. Uh, the queen bee has the same genetics as the worker bees. You know, they're very highly uh, similar in terms of the genome. Yet the queen bee lives for many years. The worker bees live for weeks to months. There's a huge difference in lifespan with exactly the same genetics. And so you can ask, well, that's an interesting question. What determines whether a bee is a queen bee or a worker bee, and it turns out to be natural compounds because the queen bee grows up in this uh, uh, royal jelly, and royal jelly has been shown by Mark Bedford's lab at my lab a few years ago to contain epigenetic drugs, including histone deacetylase inhibitors. And so there's a lot of compounds in nature that actually contribute to epigenetic regulation. There's a very recent paper that has shown a very similar system in ants because there's a very similar type of regulation in ants as, as in bees. But this is going to be a fertile ground for research both into identifying potential exposures and also potential compounds for epigenetic repro reprogramming. So with this, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce the moderators for the next session who will introduce the speakers, Dr. Ali Shamsuddin, head of, the, head of the Division of Medical Oncology at the American University of Beirut Medical Center, and Dr. Miguel Abu, chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the UBMC. They will continue the moderation of the remainder of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamali. And uh, as a continuation of our program, I would like to introduce uh, our colleague and friend, Dr. Ali Bazarbashi. He's a professor of uh, medicine and uh, professor of anatomy and cell biology and physiological sciences. He's the director of the bone marrow transplantation program at AUBMC, and he will talk about uh, the uh, uh, 
his uh, interesting research, uh, the virally driven leukemias from discovery to treatment. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I would like to say that uh, I'm delighted uh, uh, to be here, one of the speakers of this uh, cancer uh, symposium, the inauguration of Dr. Fadlo Khouri at the 16 AUB president. It's indeed a great honor for me. I would like uh, to take you through a uh, journey uh, of our uh, uh, research on targeted therapy of leukemia, focusing on a, a, a very specific uh, uh, type of druggable leukemia, which is adult cell leukemia lymphoma, secondary to HTLV-1 infection. And the journey is uh, on basic translational and clinical research from the bench to the bedside. So uh, 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 this disease, uh, uh, adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma, uh, is secondary to infection by a virus, a retrovirus, HTLV-1, which is the first oncogenic uh, retrovirus discovered in men. So the worldwide, we have 10 to 20 million people infected with HTLV-1, and you can see endemic areas on this map, and you can see that in the Middle East, we have several areas of relatively high uh, 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 endemic uh, or prevalence of HTLV-1. Overall, out of 100 seropositive for the virus, 5% will develop this leukemia, which is, an active, uh, which is a leukemia made of activated T cells, uh, but that carries a very poor prognosis due to chemo resistance and severe immunosuppression. The no effective treatment, most patients die within one year of uh, diagnosis. So in terms of pathogenesis within the HTLV-1 virus, we have a very powerful oncoprotein called TAX, and TAX actually activates or interferes with several uh, cellular pathways, it activates transcription factors, it interferes with the cell cycle, it blocks apoptosis, and it interferes with DNA repair, allowing accumulation of secondary mutation. So one question was how a, a small 40 kilodalton viral protein can do all these functions uh, 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 in the cell. And actually, we, we w were interested in uh, asking whether this can be due to what we call post-translational modifications, which are addition of cellular small polypeptides or small proteins like ubiquitin or sumo for small ubiquitin modifier. And actually, what we have shown uh, uh, is that tax is actually uh, post-translationally modified by uh, ubiquitin and by sumo on its uh, central lysines, and that this, these different post-translational modification will lead to different uh, localization of the protein. So for example, K63 ubiquitinated tags will be localized in the centrosome here and will uh, activate the I kappa B kinase. Uh, whereas uh, simulated tags will localize to uh, uh, nuclear bodies, which are intranuclear structure, and uh, this will lead to transcriptional activation, and that finally K48 ubiquitinated tags is degraded by the proteasome. So the same protein through different uh, uh, changes of the partner uh, protein covalently linked to it will have a different cellular localization, a different function, and we will see that this has also therapeutic implications. So as I told you in the introduction, ATL has a dismal prognosis. You can see here on the left that it is, uh, uh, this is from the International T-Cell Lymphoma Project, and ATL has the worst prognosis among all peripheral T-cell lymphomas. This, uh, and actually, these are data published in 1992. Uh, you can see that most patients present with the aggressive forms of the disease, the acute uh, subtype and the lymphoma subtype, and very uh, uh, small number will present with the so-called indolent forms of the disease. The four-year survival in the aggressive form of the disease 
is 5% and median survival is 6 months and 10 months. And you can see from this data published in Blood in 2015 that the prognosis did not change over 25 years and that still the five-year survival is around 10% for both acute ATL and lymphoma ATL. And even the so-called indolent forms of the disease are still carrying a dismal prognosis, where the, whether they are on a watch and wait policy in green or treated with chemotherapy in blue. So the idea was uh, that we have a, a leukemia due to a retrovirus and that this leukemia is totally resistant to chemotherapy and to monoclonal antibodies. So why not to try to target the leukemia by treating the retrovirus? So the seminal papers were published in 1995 in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, Parkash Gill from California and uh, our group at that time, I was in uh, Paris in France showing that the combination of antiviral uh, therapy with zidovudine and interferon alpha uh, 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 is uh, uh, highly effective in inducing responses in newly diagnosed or relapsed ATL patients. Then, uh, uh, recently in 2010, at AUB, we realized a worldwide meta-analysis by collecting individual patient charts from more than 250 ATL patients worldwide treated with uh, zidovudine and interferon alpha. And you can see the influence of the first-line therapy on the prognosis of uh, ATL patients. So these are overall survival data. You can see here the very dismal or poor prognosis of patients treated with first-line chemotherapy. And you can see here the prognosis of patients who received antiviral therapy with AZT and interferon as first-line therapy. And to rule out any selection bias due to the retrospective nature of this analysis, we performed a multivariate analysis that revealed that only two factors are associated with improved outcome so, uh, in multivariate analysis. So basically, chronic and uh, smoldering ATL are better than uh, acute and lymphoma, which is expected. And first-line antiviral therapy uh, uh, was associated with a 0.55 hazard ratio and significant p-value. The problem of this antiviral therapy is that it works only in half of the patients that will have a long-term survival, so still we, are, we have the other half dying from ATL, and that this treatment has to be continued forever because relapses over, uh, uh, often occur when treatment is stopped, indicating that uh, this antiviral therapy does not target the ATL stem cells or leukemia-initiating cells. So then we uh, worked uh, uh, in vitro on trying to find drugs that target the viral oncoprotein tax. And so tax is an ideal therapeutic target for ATL because chronic HTLV-1 infection in humans, tax transgenic mice, or tax transduction in stem cells uh, results in adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma with organ infiltration, circulating flower cells, hypercalcemia, and NF-kappa B activation. So the typical clinical picture of uh, ATL. And, uh, so, uh, and we worked actually on this mouse model developed by uh, Hasegawa in Japan and Bill Hall in uh, uh, Dublin. Uh, uh, where, which is a tax transgenic model, and you can see the development of an ATL-like picture in uh, this model. So among the different drugs that we uh, 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 assessed uh, for targeting tax, the most powerful uh, combination was that of arsenic trioxide and interferon alpha. So as you can see here, these two drugs, interferon and arsenic, will synergize to induce tax degradation by the proteasome 
and then in microarray analysis, shutoff of proliferation genes, cell cycle arrest, and apoptosis. So that was in vitro, and actually recently we uh, investigated the biochemical pathway of this tax degradation by arsenic and interferon. And quite interestingly, it is very similar to that of uh, PML RARA degradation by arsenic trioxide and retinoic acid in acute promyelocytic leukemia. You, as you know, uh, uh, the standard uh, therapy for acute promyelocytic leukemia is now the combination of arsenic trioxide and all transretinoic acid, and both for uh, uh, PML RARA degradation and for tax degradation, we have shown that it is uh, due to uh, post-translational sequential post-translational modifications. So basically, we will have uh, SUMO2 uh, uh, binding to tax and PML nuclear bodies upon treatment with arsenic interferon, followed by recruitment of a SUMO-dependent ubiquitin ligase, RNF4, uh, uh, ubiquitination of tax and degradation by the proteasome in PML nuclear bodies and the cytoplasm. So that was on the biochemical aspect. Then we moved to preclinical models using this uh, tax transgenic uh, uh, model. And as you can see here, uh, these uh, 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 murine ATL uh, with ATL will die within one month if not treated. When treated with single agent arsenic or interferon, survival is doubled, but still they will die in two months but then if they receive one cycle of induction arsenic interferon combination and one cycle of consolidation, 80% of the mice are cured and become tax negative even after 18 months. And uh, in terms of mechanism of action of the curative effect in mice actually using serial transplantation model, what uh, we have shown is that it targets ATL stem cells or leukemia in initiating cells. So basically, in untreated primary ATL mice, you can take the spleen cells, put them in untreated secondary, untreated tertiary, and you always have rapid ATL uh, development and death from ATL. Now, if you treat the primary mice for three days only with arsenic and interferon, you take the uh, uh, spleen cells that are quite healthy, and you put them in secondary mice that are untreated, they will grow very slowly, and you will have slow tumor growth, delayed apoptosis, and then uh, inability to induce leukemia in tertiary mice. Now, if you uh, add bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor to arsenic and interferon, to block tax degradation by the proteasome, you, uh, you reproduce the phenotype of untreated primary mice. So basically, in ATL cells, we have a tax-independent short-term proliferation and a tax-dependent long-term self-renewal, uh, which is the LIC activity, and this is what is targeted by arsenic interferon. Then we move to a clinical trial on uh, the triple combination of arsenic interferon and AZT in chronic ATL patients. 10 patients were treated we got an unprecedented 100% response rate, including 70% complete remission rate. And you can see here the rapid disappearance of the skin lesions. And interestingly, whereas in white, when you stop uh, AZT interferon alone, uh, patients will rapidly relapse. Here, when we stopped uh, the triple combination, uh, uh, three patients out of six remained in long-term continuous complete remission. Two words about the immune system in ATL. So ATL patients infected with HTLV-1, like HIV patients, have severe immune deficiency, opportunistic infections, and lack of anti-ATL response. And this immune uh, deficiency is exacerbated by chemotherapy. So what is the effect of arsenic interferon AZT? So basically, in 16 ATL patients uh, treated with the triple combination, we showed that at base, baseline, we have an immunosuppressed state 
with direct TH2 cytokine profile and uh, that uh, in high, lev uh, high levels of interleukin-10, interleukin-4, and low level of interferon gamma and IL-2, which are the TH1 profile. And upon uh, treatment, 30 days after triple uh, combination therapy, you have a sharp increase in interferon gamma and IL-2 and a decrease in IL-10 and IL-4 and restoration of an immunocompetent state. So this is our model uh, for how it works in ATL. So you have a primal infection by HTLV-1 of the CD4 lymphocytes. Then you have a clonal infection, a clonal expansion, sorry, of CD4 positive infected lymphocytes. And then after a multi-step leukemogenesis, you have development of ATL and clonal expansion of the ATL cells. At the same time, you have the CD8 positive cells uh, trying to control infected cells, but we have de novo infection of both CD8 and CD4 and dendritic cells by HTLV1 all through the life, and this will decrease the pressure of CTL on, on cytotoxic lymphocytes on uh, leukemic cells, and also the newly infected CD4 cells will feed the leukemic cells with chemokines and multiple survival factors. And this leads to further clonal expansion. Now when we, and a Treg TH2 immunosuppressed profile. Now when we add as a T interferon, we block the de novo infection. This allows to restore the immune control on ATL cells and to shut down the survival pathway of CD4 cells and you have response of the disease. Now if you add arsenic trioxide, you induce tax degradation uh, by targeting the ATL stem cells, and after a short tax independent short term proliferation, we have uh, an a extinction, extinction of the leukemic clone because the long term self renewal is tax dependent and restoration of a TH1 expression profile. Finally, uh, this is uh, our guidelines that were published in uh, blood uh, uh, in 2011 about ATL therapy. You can see as a T interferon and uh, arsenic trioxide everywhere. And actually these guidelines were adopted by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN guidelines in the US. And finally, I would like uh, to say that this is the result of a network, a global network uh, centered at AUB involving France, UK, US, Ireland, Iran, and Japan, and to thank a wonderful uh, leukemia lymphoma research team at AUB, Dr. Rehab Nasser, Hibal Haj, Margaret Chirignan, Yum Nakfouri, Rita Hlaihel, Zena Dasoui, as well as our valuable collaborators, Dr. Marwan Sabban, Ghazi Zaatari, Nadine Darwish, Ghassan Baibo and Rami Mahfouz. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vazirbeshi, for this uh, talk, and uh, we'll defer the question to the end. Uh, now, it is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce Dr. Fadi Jara. He is a professor and chairman of radiation therapy at the American University of Beirut. Dr. Jara will talk about state of the art in radiation oncology. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I will take the same stand as Jean-Pierre. I will not add to the comments about Fadlo, except for one thing, if you allow me. We are both FOF. You have to guess which one is this. <laughs> I want also to thank our speakers uh, who visited us from all over the world. And I want specifically to thank uh, my mentor and my, I would consider him also as the role model, Dr. Ki Hong. Thank you for coming here and thank you for being present during this session. Today, I, my task, Fadlu asked me to fill in for Dr. Walter Curran, who could not make it for uh, very important reasons. So I could not really take his talk uh, and uh, use it, so I uh, decided to talk on state-of-the-art radiation oncology 
and specifically on the interface between technology and biology. So over the past two decades, radiation oncology has witnessed many real developments in uh, advanced technology, starting with stereotactic radiation, intensity modulation radiation therapy, image guidance, where we use image on a daily basis to target the treatment sites, image-guided volumetric brachytherapy, in particularly in prostate and uh, GYN tumors, particle therapies, everybody has heard about protons, and of course, robotic and tracking technology, similar to what has been developed in uh, surgery. Let's start briefly about stereotactic radiation. This is basically the delivery of very high, intense, and focused beam of radiation therapy. Obviously, you have to use very uh, strict uh, accuracy to make sure that the target is well uh, hit. And at the same time, you have to use special devices on your linear accelerators. The stereotactic radiation therapy or stereotactic radio surgery is usually alluded to in the common public to gamma knife treatment, but the real term is stereotactic radio surgery, and it can be delivered by the dedicated machine, which is gamma knife, or by a LINAC. This is very simple. When we deliver one session, we call it stereotactic radio surgery. When we deliver multiple sessions, we call it stereotactic radiotherapy here. The benefit of this is basically we deliver a very intense dose of radiation to a very well-defined target, usually small target, and the benefit is the, the gradient of dose uh, diminishes very quickly, uh, sparing the surrounding structures. And this is very, very nice uh, modality for people who have intracranial targets and they can be treated with radiation either by one session or multiple sessions without having significant complications and, very importantly, not losing their hair. <laughs> now, when, we, when the target is a little bit larger, we go with IMRT, or it is Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy. This is what we call, in our jargon, dose painting. It's really literally a dose painting. The, the, the powerful algorithm of dose calculation and the interplay between the uh, dose calculation uh, softwares and the machine and treatment devices. Now they are able to give us uh, the ability to deliver a, what we call a dose painting. We can deliver the hottest dose where it belongs in the tumor and the lower doses in the reg in regions where we have to deliver lower doses and no doses or very low doses in the critical uh, structures. For example, in head and neck, we have been able to save patients from the dreadful complications of xerostomia, something that has been very difficult in the past. Now, IGRT, whoops, IGRT, and I have, I have here a, I, have, I don't know if the little movie will work. I don't think it, it was, trend. okay, I will skip that. Do you think it will work? Okay. I have a very one minute, just, okay, it's on. Fine, that's okay, we'll skip that. IGRT is basically the, uh, uh, the technology that allows us to image the patient before every session. If you wanna be very accurate, it's very important to be able to know what we are delivering, where we are delivering the dose. So image guidance radiation therapy is a tool that is now becoming very standard in all radiation department to deliver specifically well-targeted radiation therapy, making sure that the radiation is delivered to the tumor, not to the normal tissues. And this is very important. So uh, finally, about the technology, we have the proton therapy. This is a very expensive technology that has been developed over the past decade, overly developed over the past decade, mainly because the radiation has a special characteristics. Proton radiations can be stopped at the level we want. This is what we call the BRAC peak. This is a radiation dose, and when we hit the target of our choice, we can stop the beam. And this has been very important for children, where we need to deliver radiation without exiting into the organs. On the top here, we have the X-ray radiation therapy for uh, medulloblastoma patients, and at the bottom is with X-ray, and at the bottom is with protons. Look at the exit dose. In the top one, you have the green, which is a low dose, exit dose into the organs of the entire abdomen and pelvis of those young patients, while with protons, you don't have exit dose. And this is one of the magnificent development of particle therapy. That's why we have now proton therapies in many pediatric uh, oncology departments and hospitals. 
around the world. Finally, one word about robotics. The, the, the prototype of robotics in radiation oncology is called CyberKnife. Many people are familiar uh, with this uh, device. The advantage of CyberKnife is that we can come at different angles, non-coplanar delivery of radiation, and I put this fuzzy, funny picture here on the, on the left where you can see all these beamlets of radiation given to uh, specific targets. Now, having talked about that, we need to know what's the impact of technology on radiation therapy. The impact is that with all this technology on this precision of this image guidance, we have better tumor targeting, better tumor, escal tumor escalation, and better sparing of normal tissues. Now, we're going to skip that because this is apparently we are short of time. I want to just, just say a few words about stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is one typical application of this high precision and high uh, accuracy, accuracy radiation therapy. With high precision, we can deliver high doses because uh, you, we, can, we are targeting only the normal, and the, sorry, targeting the tumor tissues and non, not the normal tissues. This is an example of SBRT. We all hear about SBRT. This is a program that many hospitals now have <clears throat> around the world, including ours. We have started this two years ago. This is for tumors that are of s certain small size, and we can, this is a lung tumor, this is a PET scan showing the activity of cancer. This is the design of radiation beams around the tumor that takes into consideration breathing motions. Without, I don't have the time to develop all the aspects, thank you. And when we treat the patient with SBRT, this is what happened. This is on the top left, the, uh, the dose distribution of the treatment. And over time, three months, nine months, 15 months, the tumor typically disappears to leave place for a, some fibrotic changes. Most of the time, we need a PET scan to verify that these fibrotic changes do not contain active tumors. So this is very common, and the rate of, of success has been reported by many authors here. A, uh, a, a, a compilation study from our friend from MD Anderson, Xin Liao, who in 2010 compiled several studies from the literature showing uh, local controls close to 90% and overall survival at five years close to 45 or 50%. Now the dose, biologically effective dose of 100 or more is important to deliver, to have a very good local control. Very important, size matters, and no difference in pathologic subtype. The nodal failure is very important to keep in mind. It's not zero, because we, we treat only the primary tumors. We don't treat the mediastinum, and therefore the nodal failure is about 5 to 11 percent. Distant metastasis is also about 10 to 30 percent, depending on the size, etc. Now, the RTOG has developed studies on uh, pilot studies, phase two studies for uh, medically operable patients and inoperable patients. This study is for medically operable patients. These are the numbers, local failure 8%. And there is something very important to keep in mind, the lower failure. And something, as you, can, you could see from what I showed you, we don't really treat the lobe. We only treat the lesion, the index lesion. And therefore, we still have a risk of Peripheral lobal failure, something that our surgeon, our colleague surgeons have shown us many years ago that if you don't do a lobectomy, you run the risk of having a lobal failure. So lobal failure is present and needs to be taken into consideration. Similar for medically inoperable patient, exactly the same numbers with lobal failure and 7% of local failure. So this is important to keep in mind. We have the local component, which is very low, but the lobar is also of importance. Now, I'm going to close the last few slides on what, is the, what this a high technology has given us as far as interface with new modality in treatment of the treatment of cancer. And I decided here to use the, the immunotherapy uh, the modality, and because radiation can interface with the immune checkpoint modulators and improve the outcome. And I will show you a few slides of, of why I'm talking about that. Radiation is a local modality, so it's not immunosuppressive in the white term in terms of the general body. Tumor development is a result of both the failure of immunosurveillance and development of immune tolerance. This is very important. The immune tolerance is what keeps the tumors uh, alive and present in the, in the body. So 
We have studies that have shown that high dose radiation therapy for a dose over five gray, four gray, something that we can deliver with our new technology can enhance major histocompatibility complex class, class one antigen expressions, enhance presentations of tumor associated antigen. And this is very important because the tumor associated antigens has been shown to be increased by high dose of radiation and it leads to an increase in number and function of antigen specific CD8 or CTLs. Now, this is a cartoon that shows how radiation could improve the interplay or the interface with the immune uh, therapy, uh, with immune checkpoints and immun immunotherapy. This is a cartoon showing that when we treat the tumor, we have increase in the tumor antigens, and we have also increased expression of the MHC uh, antigens. So we have here the, ant the antigen processing cells, which have the the Treg would exerts an inhibitory effect on the CD, CD8 or CTL, which is a normal phenomenon, normal physiologic phenomenon that keeps us away from autoimmune disease. But this Treg has a receptor, it's called CTLA4, that can be inhibited by some drugs that are available. But also, sorry, but also this CD8 or CTL that once it's released from the Treg has also another problem. It has a receptor, it's called programmed DAS1 or PD1 that all, we all know about. And that, that uh, is associated or ligate with a ligand that's called PDL1. So you need to block all this interaction, all these breaks, or you have to limit all these breaks to really have an immunotherapy effect. So radiation is, can play by and presenting more antigens and activating some of these processes to improve the uh, immunotherapy effect, not only at the tumor itself, but also that is radiated, but also at tumors that are away, which we call the abscopal effect. So one study that showed anti pd on blockade and stereotactic radiation has shown to be uh, effective in, in mice. This is from Hopkins, published a couple of years ago. This is, these are mice that had tumors implanted in their brain and treated with one session of 16 gray. And look at this uh, uh, results of this experiment. On the left here, we have the control radiation therapy alone or anti PD-1 alone, but when you combine all three, you have some tumor being cured and some animals being alive. And not more, more importantly, when those, uh, when those cured mice were re-injected with xenograft cells or cells for xenograft development, those cured mice did not develop a xenograft indicating probably immunologic memory. This is very important fact that actually led some phase one and phase two trials later on. Another study that the PD-1 blockade improved the abscopal effect, this is from Mayo Clinic, showing and the primary tumor that we irradiated, the improvement of the tumor size by the addition of SABR, which is stereotactic ablative radiation therapy and anti-PD-1, but also on the secondary tumors, indicating there is a abscopal effect or effect at a distance with the usage of these two modalities. Now, we have a couple of cases here that have been published. I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is a melanoma patient who had multiple metastases, treated only to SBRT to one liver lesion, and 12 months later, the entire metastatic sites have cleared. This was a very important observation that led to many phase one and phase two trials. And this is another case for non-small cell lung cancer with the same uh, immunotherapy medication a multiple metastasis patient with liver metastasis treated with SBRT to only the liver metastasis and ipilimumab, uh, three milligram per kilo for four cycles only, and this has led to complete cure of the patients. This is, could be the effect of the drug alone or both, but many people believe this is an interaction between the immunotherapy and the high-dose radiation therapy. There are many clinical trials that are studying this, and I probably omitted many. Some of them are from MD Fighting Anderson. I'm done. And this one trial that has actually no, worth noting, 799 patients treated f for castrate-resistant prostate cancer received 8 gray bone-directed therapy and then randomized to the immunotherapy or placebo. There was borderline effect of the immunotherapy, and when they did some post hoc analysis, they showed that the good prognosis patients might have improved their outcome. This is indicating that this combination could be uh, promising and we have to wait for more studies to find out if this is going to work. 
So finally, uh, in summary, state-of-the-art technology has provided radiation therapy with a better ability to target tumor tissues. And this is creating a paradigm shift in adopting higher and more hypofractionated, shorter and effective radiation dose regimens. The interface between radiation and immune checkpoints modulation is promising, but its clinical application is still in the early stages. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fadi, for this uh, nice elaboration, especially in immunotherapy, and I think there is uh, a lot of talks now and studies, especially in phase one, uh, a new adjuvant setting in the bladder and uh, uh, rectal carcinoma. So we'll move to the last two talks, and I want to uh, give the chair to my co-chair, Dr. Uh, Aboud, to continue on uh, this session. Thank you. The next speaker needs uh, no introduction. He's already spoken, a frequent visitor to Beirut. Uh, Professor Otis Brawley is the chief uh, medical and scientific officer of the American Cancer Society. He's also professor of medicine and epidemiology at Emory and the leading champion of increasing, improving the effectiveness of screening techniques. He is going to be talking today about the magic and myths of cancer screening with a focus on uh, lung, uh, prostate, and colorectal, since you already handled bre breast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to try to get through this in five minutes. I think I can get the major messages across. We have well-designed prospective randomized studies that tell us that screening with mammography uh, uh, saves lives in breast cancer. Colorectal screening with blood uh, testing, sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy works in colorectal cancer. Indeed, the data on stool blood testing is stronger than the data on colonoscopy. The data on colonoscopy is actually based on the stool blood testing studies. Uh, pap smears and now in low resource countries, visual examination of the cervix where we paint the cervix with vinegar and we see that the dysplastic or carcinogenic tissue turns white whereas the healthy tissue stays pink uh, and then obliterating that with freezing works. And low dose spiral CT works and we discussed that a little bit earlier. One thing that I should note is many of these tests uh, in low-dose spiral CT, it shows a 20% decrease in relative risk of death. One way of thinking about that is the test does not work for 80% of the people who need it to work. People still die even though they get screened. Same is true in mammography, by the way. We think mammography lowers relative risk of death by 20 to 30 percent. That means it doesn't work for 70 to 80 percent of people who actually need it. Now, one of the big issues and one of the reasons why we're concerned about harm in screening is overdiagnosis. And people ask, how can this be that there is a type of cancer that does not need to be cured. It is not a threat to the individual who has it. I'm just going to say that science evolves and our definition of what uh, cancer is is changing and we are moving quickly from a 19th century definition of cancer that's based on histology that was given to us by Virchow, the German pathologist, to a 21st century definition of cancer. And look, let's explain that very briefly. Virchow did a series of autopsies in the 1850s on a number of different uh, types of cancers. He was the first person to actually do a biopsy. He stained them with carmine at the time, later used what we now call H&E. He was the first person to look at them under a microscope, and he actually was the first person to uh, see this. This is an adenocarcinoma. And he drew pictures of this, and he said, this is what adenocarcinoma of the breast looks like. Those people had died, and they had obviously metastatic disease. This is just a bone scan showing metastatic disease of breast cancer throughout to the bone. When he defined cancer using that biopsy, those people all had this. We at that time assumed that any time we found this diagnosis, 
it meant that that was going to progress to this. We now know that that is actually not true. Our histologic definitions of cancer have not changed over the last 160 years. However, over the last 160 years, we've had development of the X-ray, the mammogram, ultrasound, CT scanning, MRI, and even stereotactic biopsy technologies that have been patented this century. Indeed, today, I can find a five millimeter lesion in a woman's breast using all of my new technologies, MRI, ultrasound, mammography, and so forth. And with stereotactic biopsy, I can stick a needle into the woman's breast, get a piece of it, send it to a pathologist, and Matthew will do the same processing on it that Virchow did in 1853. And the difference between Matthew's microscope and Virchow's microscope, the big advance is the electric light bulb is the light source. And then Matthew will say, this biopsy looks just like what Virchow said killed that woman 160 years ago. This is cancer. to stay five millimeters, or it actually may be cause of an immune genomically programmed to progress and kill as well. This is the last slide that I'm going to show you. From epidemiology, looking at incidence and looking at mortality, it's estimated that 15 to 20 percent of radiologically detected localized lung cancers are overdiagnosis cancers. These are cancers we can diagnose and we can cure, but we don't need to cure them. It's estimated that 20 to 25 percent of mammographically detected localized breast cancers don't need to be cured. Even amongst women in their 40s and 50s, there are some of these overdiagnosis cancers. Granted, there are more of them as people are diagnosed at older ages. For thyroid cancer, it's perhaps more than 40 percent now that we've seen some data to show that uh, thyroid cancer rates in in uh, South Korea have gone to 70 per 100,000 uh, people from 5 per 100,000 in just 10 years because of ultrasound screening. The death rate has stayed the same at 4 per 100,000. And for prostate cancer, it's about 60 percent of all the localized prostate cancers. This, these are the reasons why screening can sometimes seem to be better than it actually is. The problem with screening is sometimes we cure people who don't need to be cured. And we can cure those people who don't need to be cured with incredibly invasive procedures, surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy, and so forth that have huge side effects. And so I'm going to yield to the next uh, uh, person, but we are going from a 19th century definition of cancer to a 21st century definition of cancer. The talk that Matthew gave earlier is very important because the new 21st century definition of cancer is going to involve not just histology, but also looking at genes and genomics, what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off, and it's going to give us an ability to say, this is the kind of cancer that needs to be cured, this is the kind of cancer that needs to be watched, and ultimately we're going to move toward a uh, cancer medicine that's going to be less likely to harm a patient by curing them unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you, Otis. Um, it, while we have saved the best uh, for last, uh, it's with great uh, pride that I introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Raya Saab is uh, Associate Professor of Pediatrics here at AUB. 
and she's also director of research at the uh, uh, Children's Cancer Institute. Dreya did, uh, got her MD from AUB, did her residency at Duke, and her uh, fellowship uh, at uh, St. Jude. And one of the best things that I think I've ever done was uh, to convince her to come back to AUV just after the war in 2006. She has since uh, you know, done phenomenally well. And I just have to say that her last paper was featured in the Nature Middle East uh, website. So Reg is going to talk to us about childhood uh, cancer and advances today. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, I'd like to first thank the uh, organizers for um, inviting me to talk among this panel of uh, distinguished scientists and physicians. I'm truly honored to be part of this symposium celebrating uh, the inauguration of uh, President Fadlu Khouri, as well as the initiation of the um, celebrations for the 150th anniversary of AUB. I also realized that my talk is what's standing between you and lunch, which is probably cold now. So I will try to um, move through this um, as fast as possible while still um, delivering the, the message. Um, if you go to uh, uh, cancer meetings, you will hear pediatric oncologists talking about the successes that we've had in achieving um, improved outcomes in pediatric cancer over the past 40 years or so. Here you can see the mortality rate. Uh, this is from uh, US data. And you can see the uh, mortality rate uh, versus the years. And you can see that over the um, past uh, 50 years, 40 years or so, uh, there has been a, a decrease, a sig very significant decrease, almost 50% decrease in mortality rates from both leukemias, lymphomas, as well as a uh, slightly less but still significant decrease in mortality from solid tumors in kids. Now, uh, you can see that over the past 10 or 15 years, we still have been um, improving outcome in leukemias and lymphomas. However, in solid tumors, the uh, improvement has been much more subtle. This uh, uh, large um, uh, uh, improvement uh, between 1970s and 2000 was primarily due to multimodality therapy, combination chemotherapy, and multidisciplinary care. But we do need to uh, do better. Now, over the past um, uh, five to 10 years, there has been an um, uh, explosion in uh, genomic profiling of solid tumors in kids, and that had le has led to a lot of insights that are expected to lead to um, uh, identification. Uh, we, already, we've, we've already identified um, uh, actionable targets, and uh, the next step would be getting that to the clinic where we can start seeing um, some further improvement in outcome. Um, now, uh, as all medical advances, the identification of needs starts from the bedside, and um, then this is taken to the lab to um, identify the molecular determinants of that disease using both animal cell culture models and um, to elucidate what are the drivers of that cancer and what are possible targets to be used. And the story I'm going to tell you today is um, on uh, uh, this part of the spectrum here. This uh, then, um, uh, if, uh, uh, if a target is identified, uh, taking that to preclinical therapeutics to identify the mechanism of action of a drug would be needed, which would then need to go back to clinical trials. So uh, the story I'm going to tell you today is about um, our work in trying to find uh, targets for therapy in a very challenging tumor, pineoblastoma. Uh, you can see an MRI here that shows this pineal tumor. These are very aggressive tumors. They usually occur in the first decade of life, so in kids less than 10 years of age. They have a very poor outcome, and they're um, associated with abnormalities in the retinoblastoma pathway. They occur in higher frequency in kids with mutation of the RB gene. You can see this is a survival curve. So this here is the percentage or the ratio of um, patients surviving versus time. And you can see that patients with this particular type of neuronal tumor do much worse when it occurs in the pineal region. So we really need to um, identify better treatments than chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. 
So since we already have an insight into the biology of this tumor because it occurs to a much higher frequency in children who have um, abnormalities in the retinoblastoma pathway, we decided to try to model this disease by um, uh, inactivating the retinoblastoma uh, gene the, or protein. The retinoblastoma uh, protein works by acting as a cell cycle checkpoint, so it inhibits it inhibits cells from proliferating, and this is how it acts as a tumor suppressor. So um, there are uh, um, uh, certain um, cell cycle regulators called cyclins that, can, that are expressed at higher levels when a cell wants to go into the cell cycle and divide. And um, one of those is cyclin D1. And cyclin D1 acts to inactivate retinoblastoma by hyperphosphorylating it. So what we did is um, we expressed this cyclin D1 under control of a promoter for a gene that's expressed in pineal cells. And what this does is it leads to expression of cyclin D1 in the mouse only in pineal cells. And what we found out was that um, when we looked at the brain of the mouse, this is looking um, down at the brain, so the cerebellum is up here, and these are the cerebra here, and this is the pineal region. So in the wild-type mouse, the pineal gland is very small. In this uh, mouse that we made that overexpresses cyclin D1 in the pineal gland and inactivates the retinoblastoma protein, we found that the pineal gland was much, much larger. Interestingly, though, the mice looked completely fine. So they just had a large pineal gland, but they lived a normal life. However, when we crossed them into mice that did not have P53 or into mice that had further problems in the retinoblastoma pathway, like loss of INC4C uh, protein, which is an activator of uh, retinoblastoma, then both of these mice developed tumors. To cut a long story short, what we found out was that when we inactivate the RB protein by phosphorylating it, we lead to a hyperproliferative state, sort of a pre-malignant state. And in the absence of either the P53 gene or further inactivation of RB pathway components, this leads to malignant tumor formation. However, when there's intact P53 and RB, then these progenitor cells cannot go into the cell cycle and they enter a state that is known as cellular senescence and they stay there for life without progressing into tumor. And uh, we found that that was clinically uh, likely to be relevant because when we looked at the panel of uh, children who had retinoblastoma um, uh, gene mutations, we found that over time their pineal gland increases way above what is expected in normal kids, which is shown here in pink. These individual um, dots here are the measurements for kids with um, retinoblastoma gene mutations. And we found that for those few patients that go on to develop pineoblastoma, we have evidence of P53 mutation. So it seems like our mouse model uh, does follow what happens in humans. So then we wanted to ask why and how do some lesions progress from a pre-malignant state to an invasive tumor? And this can apply to many other settings where cellular senescence inhibits progression of pre-malignant to malignant lesions, like, for example, nevi to melanoma, adenoma to adenocarcinoma. Um, it, is, it is now very well known that oncogene stimulation, whether it is cyclin D1 in our model, RAS in um, uh, lung cancer, BRAF in melanoma, uh, any type of oncogenic stimulation will lead to a period of hyperproliferation after which the P53 and the RB pathways are engaged and there is um, a cellular senescence. And these cells just exit the cell cycle, don't proliferate anymore, and just cause a pre-malignant tumor. However, a few cells, if they have a primary mutation, like a P53 mutation at this stage, they can escape the senescent response, proliferate, and lead to tumor. Another possible scenario is that hyperproliferation will lead to tumor suppression and senescence. However, some cells may um, uh, attain a genetic mutation even after they are senescent, and that will allow them to escape senescence, go back into the cell cycle, and um, cause tumor formation. And we saw that specifically in our model of RB pathway um, compromised by INC4C loss, where we could uh, clearly see a pre-malignant lesion developing from within a senescent pineal gland that then develops into a full-blown tumor. 
So we wanted to um, find, we, so then we asked if the absence of P53 leads to um, a progression of tumor, can we, if we restore P53, would we be able to prevent tumors from um, uh, progressing from a pre-malignant to a malignant state? And to do that, we used a mouse model of inducible P53, where we could turn P53 on and off by treating the mouse with tamoxifen. And we found that if we have control animals, there are, these are P53 null, they express cyclone D1, we get tumor progression in all uh, mice. If we restore P53, even only for 10 days, um, in the adult life of the mouse, before the onset of actual tumor, we can prevent tumor from uh, forming. Interestingly, though, once we turn P53 back off, the tumor progresses like crazy, and there is activation of further oncogenic pathways. And we can actually keep mice alive for a long period of time just by treating them with tamoxifen. Now, interestingly, if a tumor has already progressed and now we restore P53, we are unable to cause tumor suppression. And the reason for that is upregulation of MDM2, which inactivates P53 even if we do restore it. In this case, if we inhibit MDM2, with Nutlin, along with activation or restoration of P53, then we can inhibit tumors. So what we learned from this is that P53 restoration therapy may be effective. However, you really have to dissect the upstream regulators of P53, and the effects are different in pre-malignant versus malignant lesions. And this has implications into approaches of treatment to prevent cancer, in patients who have high-risk pre-malignant lesions versus treat cancer in those who already have invasive tumors. But, but you can't always restore P53. It's, Raya, it's, uh, please, yes. we really have to it's finish a, as soon as you a, can. Sorry. A couple okay. minutes. Um, so then we wanted to, uh, you know, in, in a lot of tumors, if P53 is um, uh, lost, you cannot restore it. If it is there, but it's upstream, uh, regulators are suppressing it, there are ways to restore it. But what if P53 is lost? So we wanted to look at downstream effectors of P53 that might be targeted to cause senescence. And one uh, kinase that we identified is CDK2, which is a cell cycle kinase. And to just you know, tell you a, a, a short story, it's already published, was published earlier this year. We found that oncogenic signaling can lead to DNA damage, which leads to P53 activation. And then this then leads to inhibition of CDK2 kinase activity. And we're trying now to identify this particular inhibitor of CDK2 kinase, which is not P21, um, as a possible target. This then leads to RB activation, which leads to transcriptional CDK2 repression. And you have to have transcriptional CDK2 repression for stable senescence. When we treat the mice with CDK2 inhibitor, CVT313, we can prolong their survival. We see that also with uh, RAS um, uh, effects uh, uh, leading to senescence due to CDK2 repression. And even, so whether we look at the P53 null mice or the INC4C null mice, CDK2 inhibition seems to be a good target and can prevent tumor proliferation. So our model is that Oncogenic activation will lead to a pre-malignant tumor. This leads to activation of the P53 and RB pathway, which leads to initial CDK2 inhibition and then actual transcriptional repression. This leads to cellular senescence and tumor suppression. If P53 is lost early on, CDK2 continues to be expressed. It's never repressed, and there's primary bypass of senescence and malignant tumor. If there is INC4C loss, then the cells can revert back into the cell cycle. CDK2 is re-expressed. And we think that we can target CDK2 at any one of those um, uh, pathways to be able to cause uh, a tumor suppression. We're also looking at downstream targets of CDK2 because it looks like CDK2 inhibitors in clinic have had some toxicity. Um, hepatic toxicity and solid tumors, we don't have any specific CDK2 inhibitors in clinical development right now. There are a couple that are PAN inhibitors that might have highest toxicity. So just... Um, final word, we're looking at, I've told you a story that's going on now in basic research. Uh, we're definitely hoping that this will be taken on to clinical research uh, later on. Um, and I just wanted to mention, since um, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about um, the, the need for collaborations and consortia for moving things forward, just recently this year, we joined the NMTRC consortium, which is based in North America, and um, uh, we are actually the 
only one of two international sites in the NMTRC consortium, and this is a consortium that tries to find novel therapeutics for pediatric solid tumors. We currently have a molecularly targeted therapeutic trial going on, and we're about to open another trial. And we also have established a research data registry, tumor and DNA biorepository, and the familial cancer registry, which hopefully will allow us to be able to have some genomic insights into our patient population in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. On behalf of myself and uh, Dr. Najis Saghir, I would like to thank you for attending this uh, meeting. Many thanks for the speakers. I'm sure we have a lot of questions that can be discussed during the lunch break. I will uh, thank for the uh, Basile Cancer Center for supporting this uh, event. So I'll invite you all to Casper uh, and Gambini just across the hall for uh, lunch and uh, drinks. Thank you.